are here for the first, very first session of Krishna. So we start with you, uh, an inspiration for all of us. Thank you. Please so, that. could we start? Yeah, please. So, Uncle, first we would like to know your full name. Uh, my surname is L.A. Tindi. Uh, why? And uh, Venkata after Lord Venkateshwara. Naga, because my father used to kill a lot of snakes till I was <laughs> born. And after I was born, he took a vow that he won't uh, kill any more snakes. And Chandra Shekhar uh, was a name suggested by my mother. It was quite a big name. L.A. Piddi, Venkata Naga Chandra Shekhar. So, initials are shortened to Y.E.I. Uh, and can we know your birthplace? I was born in Madras, it was known then. Now it is known as Chennai. And your birthday? I was born on the 27th of October, 1965. Okay. So could you please tell us about your parents? My father belonged to a family of agriculturalists in the village called Pedapudi near Tenali, which is in Kuntur district. My mother Leelavati, so she was the daughter of uh, a branch manager in insurance company and my grandmother a homemaker. Both of them were also from Gundur district. So my mother did her uh, PUC it was called which is equal to intermediate at the time of her marriage. She got married at the age of 17. My father who was then working as a lower division clerk in uh, a lab in Hyderabad, the DRDO lab, Defense Electronics Research Laboratory. And uh, they both, both got married in 1963. I am the elder of uh, two children to my parents. My younger brother is uh, I still stay with my mother and uh, my father passed away in 2008. Please support my parents. Uh, Uncle, can you please tell us about your childhood and walk us through your education? Education. When I, I, mean, I was born in Chennai and uh, later I came along with my mother to my parents' place in Hyderabad. Uh, we were a joint family then. My father and four of his brothers, his sister, his parents. So I don't have much collection, vivid uh, memory of my early childhood. But I remember the time when uh, my grandfather, maternal grandfather, was working in Madras at that time. He came and uh, told that this house is too small and too cramped for my grandson. I want him to take him back and um, he was also very much afraid that I would uh, pick up some foul words from my uncles. That was something that uh, he was worried about. This fellow's language is deteriorating. Uh, I don't want to keep him here and um, at the age of four, uh, I <coughs> went away from my parents to Chennai, Madras started staying with my maternal grandparents. Uh, I studied uh, until fourth class in Madras. The question is small about childhood. I have a big story. I will try to tell you. Uh, compress it into about four minutes or three minutes. I already consumed a minute and a half. I was um, also raised by a Telugu film character actress of that time, uh, she used to stay in her house. Uh, she goes by the name Surya Kantam. Uh, so she was like a second mother or a, shall I say second grandmother to me. And uh, my parents were there in Hyderabad in scorching heat summer and wearing the winters. Whereas I was uh, in Madras 
enjoying at the age of four and a half or five years first time the air conditioning in my life. I used to go to her house and it used to be so cool. That was the first time when I tasted apple juice. Uh, she got it in a glass. I have fond memories of that place. But she was also a very strict disciplinarian because I used to do a lot of mischief uh, in and around the place. I was the most mischievous boy in the whole gang there. She was unmarried officially and uh, she didn't have any kids. So I was in fact uh, practically ruling over her house. But uh, whenever my <coughs> grandmother used to face problems from me, she used to go and tell her. Then uh, she used to tell, have you seen me in that movie? I am like that even outside. I am going to take you to task. I don't spare people. She used to have a habit of waving her left hand. She, and then she told me one funny thing is that I have a glass uh, window sort of thing. And, and she used to stay on the top floor. I used to say, I will be watching you through that. Be careful. She used to tell me. And I always, whenever I used to go to take bath, I used to see up whether she has a window there in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I was always scared that she will see me when I uh, am taking my bath. I one day confided it to my grandmother. She said, oh, no, it is not there in the bathroom, it is everywhere else. I never found that mirror, but that was a fond memory. I was uh, the darling of uh, my uncles and aunts from the maternal side. Whatever interview you are going to take, whatever things you are trying to learn about me was summarized my, by my grandfather when he wrote a poem about on me on my fifth birthday. Two lines of that. But the first line, the first few words will itself give you what I am. He wrote a part of the Lavadu, Chinnima se Chandra se Karaduni. Chalaga Chudali, Yedu Kondalavadu is what he But Yedu Tika Pata Pata Galavadu, he recognized that trait in me when I was five years old. So that's how it has been trying to match horses for the courses. It was a very happy childhood. After my fifth, uh, I mean fourth class, I returned to my parents uh, in Hyderabad because my grandfather had retired from service then and uh, he shifted back to Bunto. So that was my early childhood. I, I was educated in uh, three schools. One school, I didn't know its name, I still remember it. It was like um, the hangar in an airport uh, <coughs> with some uh, roofing of corrugated sheets, but I used to call it aeroplane shed. I don't know why, my first school is still an aeroplane shed. And uh, for any security question is asked for any Google account or anything, what was the name of your first school? I always write even to this day aeroplane shed. Uh, then I shifted to another uh, school, which is the Money's Children's School, it was called, and it's now located. It's still, it was still there about 10 years back when I went to Madras. And um, uh, it's uh, close to the Madras Music Academy in Alva, right? We used to stay in CIT Colony, Chennai. And uh, that was the place where I first knew have a good interest in music. When I first listened to Gayatri on Meena, She's a, she was a child prodigy. And uh, Gayatri, if you go and do a YouTube search, you'll find that she's an excellent uh, Veena exponent. That's where I first, as a very young boy, in the school grounds of Money Student School that I heard uh, Gayatri perform on the Veena. She was 10 or 11 at that time and I was about 6 or 7. In my childhood, can I start? You are, are you asking about my whole life? Okay. Memorable event. Is it one memorable event or many memorable events? Events. Events.
what would rank first for me as a memorable event in my life uh, is the birth of my kids. There is nothing to surpass that pleasure. The birth of my kids was, a, was, is and will always be a memorable event for me. Otherwise, as a child-like desire, which is known to a couple of people. So I, I always keep a few set of people whom I always want them to praise me. So whenever they praise me, that becomes a memorable event for me. Leaving aside that, that was in a lighter way. But otherwise, I would rank next to that is um, an everyday event which I used to have that is uh, when I go to bed uh, I used to lie down on my father's uh, chest region and try to go to sleep so that, that feeling I still have as my memory uh, that um, say, shall I say the aroma of my father uh, his normal voice, his breath mixed in with his he was a, he was a very uh, he was a chain smoker so he used to have that cigarette smell and his body body smell everything combined together it was peculiar and unique to my father and it's still that uh, you know being with my father and listening to him speak uh, that uh, that's a memorable thing this interview is being recorded so I would say that meeting my wife for the first time is a memorable thing in my life. In addition to that, uh, there was one, one competition at uh, in our colony and my boys used to have some running and um, uh, some athletic events. Girls used to participate in singing and uh, debating. I used to participate in both the events, both boys and girls <laughs> and all the events I used to participate. And uh, well, one long jump when we had and I stood some second or I didn't win it. But one person who was very elder to me, I still remember the way he appreciated me and um, said that um, we should extend this spirit of winning to every phase of your life. Don't stop with this jump. This <coughs> jump is one small thing. He was an elderly person. I still remember whatever he said. And apart from that, getting a job uh, was a memorable thing. And then getting pay hikes all the time. It was centered about money and living. So all that uh, we are now is thanks to the job uh, that we got. And, and then kids' education, now my daughter is going to get married, so that will be another memorable event. I've cut it very short. And also I've cut down the events to suit the interviewer's age. Um, Uncle, we have heard that you played cricket alongside or opposite to MSK Prasad, Chief Selector of the Indian National Cricket Team, uh, Satya Nadella, uh, Microsoft CEO and others. So can you please tell us about your cricketing history? There is no cricketing history that I can claim to be my own. MSK Prasad was, uh, rather before he became a chief selector, was a friend through a mutual source. <coughs> MSK Prasad was much, much junior to me. I don't even know when he played or how he played. Uh, but he, I, I knew him through a mutual source, a cricketing uh, friend. Um, I 
did not uh, play with him. Satya Nadella and uh, others were also juniors to me, but uh, we had matches when he was re representing Little Flower School. <coughs> he was from uh, HPS Begumpet, at a public school Begumpet. We used to have uh, inter-school competitions. Maybe when I was in high school, he should have been in primary school or middle school. I don't really remember. But I have uh, good memories of uh, uh, Muhammad Azuruddin. I used to see him as a, a player uh, from All Saints School. He was in All Saints School. When we were in middle school, he was representing the high school. We used to have the competitions at school level in lower school, middle school and high school, or primary school, middle school and high school. So when he was a very good fielder then. But not much known about his batting prowess. There was one bowler by name Khalid Abdul Kayum who was very good and I was also uh, uh, lucky to watch uh, Saad Bin Jang, he was a player in Hyderabad, uh, he was also playing for all sides and he was the nephew of uh, former Indian cricketer Abbas Ali Beg. Saad Bin Jang was an excellent batsman, very classy. And uh, the wristiness that you see in most Hyderabad players uh, of playing from the offside to the leg side, that wristiness was uh, completely, uh, was, he immortalized it rather. Sarpinjan was an excellent fielder in the covers. Uh, cricket was for me a misplaced priority for the simple reason that I could not achieve much in cricket. And with the fond hope and also taking the excuse of cricket, I neglected my studies. So in the end, uh, I ended up nowhere. But still cricket was a was, uh, medium for me to express myself. I played reasonably competitive cricket at school and at the university and also at represented uh, the zone for seniors, uh, South Zone for seniors, but those are all memories now. I learned maybe the spirit of uh, being a sportsman uh, through cricket. And uh, uh, cricket is where I lost my tooth. So if there is any loss from cricket other than studying and being a good student, physically I lost a tooth while uh, in a uh, practice session in our school. Recently when I visited Hyderabad, I went to the very spot where I fell down and lost my food. I was trying to remember it. But still to get uh, nice that you asked me about it, I didn't achieve much. Uh, but um, it taught me how to be a sport. Uh, what are the other activities or fields you have explored? Could you please tell us about them? There was nothing that was not worth exploring for me. Even when I did, I did still don't know swimming to this day. But if somebody was going for a swim, I used to go tag along with them, jump and us. Somehow some older fellow used to pull me by the hair and get me out. And I am the only person, perhaps, if you would have visited Hyderabad, to know that there is a, a earlier past river which is now full of filth, Musi River, which has all the uh, outlets from the drainage going uh, into it. I must have been the only fellow in Hyderabad who would have gulped down little water from the Musi River also. Because when somebody was uh, going there trying to cross to the other side, I went along with them and I was warned uh, that I shouldn't go there. Older people, no, no, let us explore, let us go to the other side. And on the slippery rocks I fell down. But still I tried, I, I was luckily saved from drinking more of the Musi water. But, I hope the stench is not there in my words anymore. In addition to that, all sports, all sports, uh, whether they were indoor or outdoor, I tried my hand at that. I failed miserably at tennis. I still don't know how to play it. Other sports, uh, 
used to do for the fun of it. And yes, uh, I made a lot of friends in the process. I made a lot of friends in the process. We used to have a lot of open spaces then. It was possible for us to make our own shuttle badminton courts, uh, ball badminton. Shuttle badminton, no indoor stadia like you have here. We were playing it uh, outside, outdoors. We used to have three, three houses, houses on three sides, somewhere in the car parking area, to try to put up. And play. I, I also used to play marbles. I used to like playing marbles. I, there was one girl uh, who was my classmate's younger sister. She taught me playing with the stones. Her name was Lata. So five stones which you play, put your hand like this, push them and again you have to take. Then she started playing tricks. That girl, she is losing, she is younger to me. So she started making funny rules. You should throw and catch with your left hand. Lot of other things. I mean instantaneously she used to make rules. So that I lose. I played even that I used to play tennis with uh, young friends. Then skipping rope, they used to twirl it around and then two will be twirling it and then you go in between, join and then start jumping. So initially going in and joining was a problem. I always used to make friends who are much older to me or much younger to me. Very rarely with people who are of my age. I was always being commented upon for doing that. Uh, I also used to participate in local cycle races. In fact, learning the cycle was uh, a very, very good experience. The first thing is that you do like put your legs in between and try to pedal and then you will find that you, if you are wearing a full pants, uh, that will go and uh, entangle in the chain. So for that uh, you used to, uh, you have to you wear shorts. But the most beautiful <coughs> thing one wonderful memory, Ms. Rishita, is that the first time when I was able to come to the seat, when you are driving a cycle and then come first time on the seat and you are pedaling, you feel as though you have won over everybody else in the world. Earlier it was through that, first thing it was called kainchi. Kainchi means scissor. Kainchi, so like a scissor, uh, you go and pedal in between. Then that's, there, there is that uh, danda, they used to call it. Danda. So the next stage was Danda and then seat. Kainchi to Danda to seat was a wonderful journey. The moment you went on to the seat, yes, you have won over the world. I used to take part in the local cycle races I, and then could that move him? Hopping, hopping. Hopping also was a favorite pastime. There was Gili Danda. Gili Danda and then Tabba Footley, a um, lot of other things. But I, I put my hand in all, all that a man or a, uh, or a young child, a young boy, young girl, whatever they could do, laid on that. Singing? Huh? Mm -hmm. Did it ask me? Can you please tell us about your all over experience at NSTL? This NSTL, I won't be making a retirement speech in Mansi, so maybe you can use this for that. <laughs> because I, 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 I want to slip away silently, as silently as I came. When I came, I was an unknown. So when I go back, I'll go as an unknown, except for a few people. The campus who will maybe remember me uh, when I'm gone. This uh, organization has uh, given me everything that uh, I could rise from the ashes and uh, be where I am today, wherein I can comfortably say that I am happy. And um, yes, I, I started my journey in the high speed towing tank. And uh, I joined with my VTEC degree with uh, bad so I joined as a junior scientific assistant. And the task I was given was that uh, there is one carriage there, mechanical uh, 
driven carriage, you have to carry out the mechanical maintenance, maintenance of that. And my first teachers were from the Fahul erectors, the casual employees who were there. Uh, one Mr. Muhammad, I still consider him my teacher in NSTL, he used to teach me how, uh, how to maintain the carriage or rather for the motors and uh, periodical checks to that. Uh, Ward Leonard generator said all these things were new. I picked up from them, and uh, the job began that um, like a um, uh, person who drives a rickshaw, uh, uh, pulls a rickshaw, go from here to there. Okay, Chandrasekhar, three meters per second, you go. Then I have to put on to three meters per second that speed, and press the horn, and then uh, start it, and it goes. And then while coming back, you should come at only. 1.5 meter per second, okay sir, I will. So that is how I began my journey. And then I was lucky enough uh, to grow up in the organization. I, I learned all my skills, uh, technical skills uh, in this organization. With time, whether I deserved it or not, I got a few promotions. Uh, I just started going up the ladder. Somehow now uh, it's a time that I, I have begun my journey downhill. It's a ple pleasant walk. Going uphill is difficult. You go out of you run out of breath. Whereas uh, walking downhill is easy as long as you don't look back. If you look back, you will remember the days when it was hard to climb. You crossed it. Now you are climbing downhill. Look down below the meadows and the plains are welcoming you. Lot of things to do. But overall, my journey in NSTL was very happy. I learned a lot of things. I made a lot of friends and I learned a lot of lessons. You are one of the senior most scientists at NSTL. What, according to you, are the qualities a young or aspiring scientist should possess? If you consider age as a <coughs> qualification for seniority, I am one of the senior most scientists. But rank-wise, I am much, much, much down the ladder. There are a lot of other scientists. Sorry to um, disagree with what you said. But still, I take it as a compliment um, when you ascribe seniority to me in some form or the other. The qualities required of an aspiring scientist, if you are asking me as somebody who wants to be a scientist. The first thing I would like to tell you about is that being called a scientist at NSTL is a misnomer. We are not scientists, we are application engineers. We have learned a bit of science, we have learned a bit of technology. We have a few systems with a few needs that need to be developed. So we are applying the principles. We are not doing any research ab initio from the scratch. A scientist is one who <coughs> observes the laws of nature, makes experiments on those laws, brings out data subject to certain assumptions he makes the experiments, reads the data, and tries to deduce, find out what is the result of that experiment and then tries to apply that to the original law and modify it in such a way that there will be some useful technology that will spin out of it. That's what a scientist is supposed to be. Now if you are asking me if you really want to be a scientist, from whatever little I picked up by watching some good scientists, but also by reading about them. The first thing that a scientist needs to have is curiosity. Why is it like that? Well, unless you question why is it like that, you will, your, your mind will not be prepared to comprehend what is going to come next. If you see something and leave it at that, you will not know why is the tube light burning or glowing like that. What is behind it? You should be more curious. On a, on a lighter way, I tell you, 
you must have watched that movie uh, one comedian telugu movie is ali he he uh, bob mohan i don't know three things hindu enti ela bob hindu enti ela how what why how and what these are all questions that are related to curiosity in us why is the sun rising only from the east why is that flower only red in color why is that tree bearing flowers which have different colors why is it that the pressure cooker makes a shrill sound when the food is ready why am i able to pedal the cycle only forwards why am i not able to pedal it backwards why is my teacher <coughs> asking me uncomfortable questions making me uncomfortable that was about science this is about change in ourselves why is the teacher always trying to find fault with me maybe i am doing a mistake here what is this why doing it doing to you this why or what is giving an opportunity to learn so if you are curious you will learn for a scientist he needs to learn things how they work why they work why do the laws of nature work this way why is the earth round why can't it be flat all questions so curiosity is the first thing that is required of a scientist the second thing i feel very much is required is organized behavior or discipline only when you are organized only when you are good at small things will you be able to achieve bigger things and science is an organized body of knowledge so when you are trying to work with an organized body of knowledge you too need to be organized the third thing is honesty the scientist needs to be very honest whatever he is doing whatever he is studying whatever conclusions he are making he is going to affect the society at large not just his workplace not just his marks whatever he does is going to affect the society at large he needs to be honest if he finds that his deduction is wrong he should bring it out to notice of the world if he is not honest he is doing great disservice to the society then the fourth thing is should be willing to experiment <coughs> unknown things because the basis on which you get results is based is the experiment and your experiment should be truthful am i really bringing whatever is required to the table to conduct this experiment are the input parameters correct we should not fudge anything either the input or the output we should be very careful we should be truthful honest even in doing the experiment and then coming back to the organized thing we should be very diligent diligently note down what are the results of your experiment in whatever form no don't miss anything if there is a failure record it failures are the biggest teachers Those are the biggest teachers, and if you hide those, it's not correct. So record everything, everything diligently, exactly as you find it. If you find that the solution has turned blue green, write blue green, even though your operation manual says it should turn brown. Then you will start asking, why has this this turned blue green? Something wrong with the chemicals? Something wrong with the amount of chemical that I need? something wrong with the chemical itself or did i use it at different temperatures <coughs> than what was prescribed so you will learn many things 
then you record everything truthfully and diligently. So you have stepped from your curiosity to diligence. After that, the most important thing of a scientist is to declare and make results public. He may have his patents, he may have his own things that he requires for him to grow up in his career. But that is not what a scientist is expected to do. He is expected to do good to the society. So he should give out the results. Maybe he will not make money out of it. Maybe he will not make money. If he holds a patent and a big multinational company contacts him and buys it, then he might get a lot of money. And the problem with everybody around us is that we are working day in and day out to solve the problems of the rich. Whereas the rich by themselves don't have any problems. Whatever work you do, if it is going to benefit the common man, common man in the society, that is where your work finds purpose. If you are going to make the house of a very rich man much more better, it's good, it will fetch you money, it will fetch you name, it will fetch you fame. But if you build an earthquake resistant house at a low cost for people in earthquake prone areas, that will may be recognized, may not be recognized. You might get some political patronage later, later and maybe before you die you might get a Padmashi. It is possible that you would. But if you look at yourself, you can sleep happily at night when you hear about the next earthquake in that region and you find that nobody has died there due to house collapse. Because you have worked there and you have done something that will benefit them. So we don't have to work or rather do research as a scientist to make the rich people richer and better. Do something which will benefit the society. So you are diligent, you publish your results, you tell everybody that this is what I have achieved, this is what I have got, this is what I have not got. And the second thing is that, and the last thing is that, a scientist should never rest on his laurels. If you've got an experiment and uh, done successfully, and uh, you found that it is benefiting society at large, don't rest on your laurels. Ultimately, how much you contribute is what will make you happy. So don't stop anywhere. Keep going. So we are shifting on to the rapid fire section. So you'll be getting five seconds for each of your question. So hopefully that's. Uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Well, my heartbeat, I'm just checking. It's <laughs> rapid fire. Okay. So if your parents let you name yourself when you were five years old, what would you name? What would your name be? I would have named myself Jaisima. Any nicknames? What are they? Penguin I was called when I was at school. Maybe because of the way I walk when I go into bowl. What is your favorite activity? I read a lot. How many books have you read till now? About 2000. Really, how many books you might be reading? I read on an average of 100. What is your favorite book or series? I like uh, books by Alistair Martin. Name at least one book you read that positively shaped you. What do you say after you say hello? By Dr. Eric Burr. <laughs> uh, printed book or e-book? Printed book. I don't read e-books. If you have to describe yourself in three words, what are they? Childlike, incorrigible fool. <laughs> uh, who would play you in the movie of your life? <laughs> Pardon? Who will play your role in the movie of your life? Obviously myself. Nobody else can play me. <laughs> okay. We'll shift back to the mom. Yeah. Ma! That is where I get there. I can't think of that. No, there are 10 more questions. Afterwards. Okay. 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 Yes, please. What is the most memorable event at LSTU? <coughs> lot of memories associated. So, most memorable I 
I still rank uh, seeing my name on the results board of being selected at NSTL as the most memorable moment. So um, I can say that a visit of so and so, <coughs> this meeting or that encounter is fine, but still, <coughs> first is always the best. If not NSTL, what profession would you have chosen? I would have sailed with the wind. I had no choice because I had very poor academics. And thanks to the benevolence of some good Samaritans, I could join this place. Otherwise, I would have gone where the wind would have blown. Uh, how do you balance your work and private life? There is nothing called balance. Work is work, private life is private life. Where do you go or what do you do when you need inspiration? I talk to myself. That is when I learn where I am going wrong. I try to stay away from whatever wrong I am doing. Deliberately cut myself off from them. As I, as I said, said, childlike, I come back to that. It's taken me a lot of time to learn, unlearn, learn, unlearn. But I haven't yet learned. What is the best piece of advice you have received, you have received till now? Be yourself, is what my father told me. Any predictions for the next 10 years? I named the craziest. Prediction for the next 10 years is, there is only one word that will dictate our lives in the next 10 years. That is called, it begins with the C and uppercase capital, it is called connectivity. We are going to be connected to everything and everybody around us. How well we manage this connectivity, how well we channelize the energy in that connectivity and how well we utilize it for our good is going to dictate how the world will lead its life in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So connectivity is the key for everything. What is your craziest prediction of the future? Having breakfast at the Lagrangian points in space. If we were older, I would have told something else. But having breakfast at the Lagrangian points in space, even if the world were to be destroyed <coughs> by a catastrophe and all the energy of the Earth were to collapse into some other star, if you are at the Lagrangian points in space, nothing would happen to you. They will be unaffected. Lagrange. Lagrangian points, they are called in space. What are, what are Those are locations in space which are unaffected by changes around it in space. So having breakfast at those points, space travel is going to become a reality. Yeah. So having breakfast there is one of the craziest <coughs> things that can happen. Okay. Uh, if you are asked to give a tech talk, what would you talk about? How to be a human. Uh, what technology will transform the future? Why do you think so? We are hooked to the small devices that are extension of our arms. Any technology that takes change in that small device, which is an extension or an appendage to our five fingers, that is going to dictate our lives. There was a song in a Telugu movie, Buchadamma <coughs> Buchadu, Bulli and telephone was there. There was one Buchadu. Now in this, we have a Burma Rakshasi with thousand children and ten thousand grandchildren. So there is no longer a Buchadu in this. That is going to dictate how you will live. Let's say you are a kid again and you have to study. How will you approach it? I will study well. I will not play cricket. I will try to get good marks. I will not try to cheat my parents. I will try to be sincere. I will try to do my homework better. I will try to get at least 60% marks. Oh, my. Uh, can you please tell us the systematic approach that you use, which we can use to solve problems? It may not be right for me to tell you about a systematic approach because randomness has always been my forte. Yeah. 
so there is nothing systematic about me but you can learn from the lives of people who are more systematic and your question itself has the answer you follow a system and be systematic that's success When you write, you give voice to your thoughts. When you write, you let the world know what you are. When you write, you will be able to understand yourself better. When you write, you will be able to communicate better. When you write, you will have an opportunity to touch lives better. When you write, you will know what is right. uh can you please tell us th- any three things that you wanted to share with us uh, but you could not come but we could not come up with a question for that i should appreciate you both <coughs> for uh, the wonderful questions that you prepared i don't think you haven't forgotten anything at your age and uh, you are i should say good achievement that you have uh, in your life till now you have covered almost almost everything there is nothing you can't i can't name one so forget about three tell us three habits that we can incul- inculcate for our betterment as students there are three laws that they have to follow first law is study second law is study third law is study unfortunately for me it was the fourth option none of the above <laughs> but it's good follow the path set by your predecessors listen to your parents <laughs> while you have the inclination as long as you have the inclination to learn read well read wide read long it always helps when you read refresh yourself with breaks don't get caught up in the web of monotony try to do things different within the boundaries of family and social acceptance grow wings make your wings stronger so high so our question sent here but we Thank do you. have 10 more rapid round questions okay. so we shift back to the rapid fire you have again just 5 seconds to answer the questions so can we start yeah please what what is one of the things that you would put on your bucket list I want to go and visit uh, the place where Shakespeare played his first drama Stratford upon Avon in UK that's one number one on the bucket list number two I want to meet Donald Trump what is your favorite thing about someone in your family I love my father I love him still for his courage and his strength in uh, in times of distress and challenges uh what is your favorite holiday destination <coughs> can you name one in abroad and uh, one abroad in one in india in india it is my home sweet home that is where i like to enjoy my holidays the most right. abroad anything that you should have is maybe places where um, you can roam around in nature Anywhere closer to nature is fine for me, and I like to play with tiger cubs. So I haven't <coughs> seen even a tiger <coughs> playing with them. Thailand, I heard. So maybe Thailand only for that will be a good destination for me. If you are asked to teach, which grade or age would you prefer, and which subject? I prefer fifth class. and social studies 
What is the most interesting thing you have in your purse or wallet? My family's in the house. What is the song you hear most often? Uh, there is no limit to the songs that I hear. Your favorite? My favorite uh, <laughs> is somebody whom your, your grandfather might have listened to, it's about Kundan Lal Sahir. He's the first superstar of Indian cinema. What is better, being marginalized or attention to detail? How do they both differ? Uh, being like, we are like in the sense that uh, you want to... You are fussy about small things. Yeah. We are giving attention to detail. And uh, being organized, both are qualities of the female race. Men generally are never organized and they don't fuss about little things. Every man initially was in the mother's womb a woman until the extra chromosome setting. So we do have a little bit of a woman in us. We always want to be organized, but we are never organized. But still I would tell you that being organized will always happen. I would uh, talk to him about trying to build a nuclear shelter for everybody in every town or city. How to build a nuclear shelter with a neighbor who has access to nuclear weapons and with the um, neighbor becoming a banana republic, almost becoming a banana republic. Who knows when they will press the nuclear button? They are not even educated. They don't even know what, to, what will happen in case there is a nuclear attack. It is very likely. I'm not sounding pessimistic, but that is likely. <coughs> so I'd ask the president to take some initiative to train people on how to react in a nuclear emergency and build shelters for nuclear attack at least in vulnerable cities of the country. Uh, what is your life mantra? Be happy. Aham Brahmasmi. Huh? Aham Brahmasmi. I am that. So the session ends here. Thank you. So nice speaking to you. I, I just have uh, one or two questions more. Please. So you said read wide. So what what does that mean? Uh, especially I'm asking with, us, with uh, respect to these kids. What does as, it mean? As a kid, you start with a particular series or a particular style of writing. <coughs> but as you grow up, you get focused onto one genre of uh, reading. When we were young and uh, we used to watch the girls in our college or at school, we used to have uh, the, the Mills and Boone series with them. And um, young, uh, we read uh, Enid Blyton, uh, Famous Five and Secret Seven, they read Nancy Drew. So, we get stuck up in a genre or a particular style of writing. But when you say read wide, you, you read a lot of things that you come across. The advice that I got from my father about reading was that don't discard anything as not worth reading. It was that way. And if you are going to, going to a place on the beach and you are <coughs> eating some eatery given to you in a piece of paper, don't throw it away. Try to read what is in that. It might be a whole piece, scrap of newspaper. But my father asked me to read it. Because there might be something useful in that. And reading is like charging a battery. So keep it charged always. Who knows when you'll have to retrieve from that source of energy. It will be useful sometime. So when you say read wide, don't restrict yourself to one genre, one type of books, one language. One style of writing, read wide and read deep, read long, try to read tomes because they will improve your focus. When you read bigger books, they will improve your focus, they will improve your memory, they will let you pick up uh, the skills of vocabulary, they will give you an insight into the minds of literary giants 
and they will also give you an idea of to how you need to write the style how is he trying to express the idea if somebody has written a tome of 1300 pages and is building it up on a central idea <coughs> look at how much effort and research he would have done to bring that central idea to fruition based on one particular starting point he would have begin begun with a prologue until he goes to the epilogue how is he dragging the thread that idea throughout how is he writing when you read big tomes that is what you get until you read wide everything that you come across everything that is worth reading and prescribed keep reading it and you read read deep you read when you read deep look into the mind of the writer what is he trying to convey if you can do research about him where was what was his life why did he write like this what prompted him to do this something must have come yes one question sir yeah i have two more questions no, please 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 uh no these problem. days uh these kids have a lot of uh, activities at school activities a lot of activities homework study and they're into sports arts dance music what not everything almost everything so how much time you used to read when you were in school and what do you suggest for this generation kids the kids of the present day generation are spoiled for choice they have so many things to choose from the variety of things the variety of distractions the variety of getaways that they have are immense compared to what we had when we had in our childhood reading was always secondary for a person like me but if it was restricted to something other than college or school curriculum i was a voracious reader there used to be a lending library in our colony in every day every single day i used to go run to him and exchange a book so always he surprised do you only see the pictures or do you read was what he was asking but i was always trishna thirsting to finish it quick so that i get the next book so but nowadays um, we have a lot of choices the kids are also the ambitions of parents whatever we did achieve they have to achieve the kids have kids have become the pal bearer for your desires is it right that you cast your burden and you make your children carry your cross is it right that something the parents have to ask but at the same time you are going to send the kids to face a world that is highly competitive and you will not send a soldier who is ill equipped or unequipped to a war your child is going to a war so you want the child to be fully equipped fully aware of the rules fully prepared to face war so it is a dichotomy it's a dilemma for parents where should i begin and where should i end the kids by themselves have a lot of choices so i i i feel that if you are trying to make your child go out into the world the first thing that you can instill in them is the quality of uh, um, uh, essential ingredient which is self confidence it's the most important thing if you are confident about your own self the body and the mind will bring forth all the defensive mechanisms to survive in the so called uh, competitive world that i was referring to if you are confident enough the body and the mind both have the capacity to bring out the defense mechanisms that are inherent this madam she when she was uh, organizing one international women's day one swimmer girl patti sharma you had a photograph uh, with her i remember so it's, it's a normal girl from a normal town uh, swimming across the seas how could she do it i mean there are reserves of both mental and physical energy within us so instead of trying to cram up our kids minds with the defensive mechanisms from outside it's better we build up the confidence within themselves using which they can bring out their own defensive mechanisms but but the parents need to be very much sure 
hand in control of what the kids are doing, watching, seeing, listening. Because, as I said again, the choices are many. Still, self-defense mechanism spawns out of self-confidence. And if any activity that is being given to them is building up that confidence in them and making them physically strong, fine. And I don't subscribe to the idea of either a strict school curriculum or a very free school curriculum. You need to have a uh, balance again. It's a mirage, uh, a never-ending chase. We will never get it. So somewhere you have to draw a line. You don't have to be too strict with the curriculum and you don't have to be free. Uh, you, you can't expect in the 21st century a student from Shantaniketan to do path-breaking research unless he is really gifted. Yes, you need to equip them with the tools. It is good to study under trees, but only up to a certain level. Montessori education, for that reason, is only up to class 5 or 6. Beyond that, you don't have the Montessori type of education. Uh, there, you are not taught by rote, you are not asked to learn by rote. It's fine. <coughs> Again, you need to come back onto the tracks. And you need to run with the best to be the best. Yeah, with respect to writing, you said like you when you write, uh, you said when you write, you have a lot of list. So I finally you ended with when you write, you are right. Okay. So I think uh, these kids have to have the habit of writing. So what do you suggest when the kids and people like me also like how how we can start writing and how we can improve on our writing? The question has the answer. How do you start writing? By starting to write. I mean, we keep up. Nothing like no that. You observe. Again, it's the quality of observing, which when you observe, you set your neurons into <coughs> motion. You start thinking when you observe. Now, today you can just sit down near the dining table and observe your mother, how she moves in the kitchen. You can write a beautiful story about her because your mother, when she cooks food, is an algorithm in motion. Step one, this, after two, do this. If this is bad, do this. If this is not tasty, do this. Use this vessel. This vessel is small, take the bigger vessel. Do it this way. Every act of the mother in the kitchen is an algorithm in motion which is filled with love for those whom she wants to give. So you write about your mother. You write about what you see outside. You, if you are seeing outside, you can try. You see a leaf falling. You write about the journey of a leaf. Think more about the leaf. What it underwent. How was it born? And then what storms it endured. When it was sun and when it was hot, it was baking. Still it survived. When it was rain, it was drenching. Still it smiled. It never took water onto it. It allowed the water to drip down. So much to a leaf. I'm just thinking about it now. Spontaneous on the moment. You can write so much about a leaf. And when the time comes, you will not hear a leaf when it is falling down, making any sound. Soundlessly, painlessly, the leaf goes away. <coughs> That's how we need to go. And then what we do, again, it goes back to the Mother Earth, composed, and then it becomes food. For uh, the, uh, uh, it becomes food, and then it becomes an agent for fresh growth. Okay. So when you fall, that's not the end of it. You make others to grow. So about, I was just a casual way talking about a leaf. So it can be about a mother working in the kitchen, a working mother what she goes through, how she rushes in the morning and then makes everything for everybody. Fathers keep shouting, kids keep nagging, but still the mother goes to office on time and she has to face funny bosses. She has to go through a lot of things. She has to come back and work again. Lot of things to write. I think I have taken a lot of your time, but I, I felt happy interacting with you. If you have one more, two more questions, fine sir, I'm, it's okay. That's it. Thank you.